Hi everyone, um, I'm Tal Hasner, uh, I'm one of the program chairs, and on behalf of the program chairs, I want to uh, also welcome you to beautiful Lake Tahoe. I was asked to introduce the first uh, invited speaker, possibly because we both share the same first name, so little chance of mispronunciations, Professor Tyler Bell. Um, she's a full professor at the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering at McGill um, in Montreal, where she's also the director of the Probabilistic Vision Group and uh, Medical Imaging Lab at the Center for Intelligence Machines. She did her master's and PhD at McGill in computer vision and then went on to do her postdoc at the Montreal Neurological Institute where she started work on medical image analysis and discovered that you can actually use computer vision to do some good. She's authored around 100 peer-reviewed papers and she's involved in organizing major international conferences including co-organizer uh, co and satellites events uh, chair for Mikai 2017, lead co-organizer for uh, Bambi, Bayesian, and uh, graphical models for biomedical imaging workshop at uh, Mikai 2014-16. She's co-organizer of the medical imaging workshop at CVPR, area chair for both CVPR and Mikai, and general chair for the joint national conference AIGI CRVIS. She's acting director, co-organizer, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, Canadia Collaborative Research and Training Experience in Medical Imaging and Analysis. Associate Editor for PAMI and CVIU. Um, her research interests are probabilistic and machine learning methods in medical image analysis, particularly in uh, neurology and uh, neurosurgery. Unlike, um, I'm guessing, most of the people here in this room, her work actually goes to saving people's lives, and uh, the tools that uh, uh, were developed in her lab have been integrated into operating theaters and assists in image-guided neurosurgery for tumor uh, resections. The title of her talk is Probabilistic Machine Learning for Lesion and Tumor Detection, Segmentation, and Disease Prediction in Patient Brain Images. I'd like you all to please welcome Professor Arbel. Thank you so much for that very uh, generous introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. I feel very honored to be chosen to be keynote for this conference. Um, so I don't have anything else to add about myself. I was trying to think of something uh, else I could tell you about myself, so I decided to tell you something very personal, which is basically just to show you an image of my brain. Um, so here's my brain over here, and that's probably more than you hear about most speakers. Um, so I work on a lot of different things. My research lab is primarily in computer vision, and I work on many different areas within computer vision, medical imaging, but today I'm going to focus on uh, this particular area of research, which is ongoing in my lab for a good 15 years now. Um, and so that'll be sort of the area that I'll focus on. So I don't need to convince any of you that machine learning um, has led to huge breakthroughs in the field of computer vision um, from all kinds of applications and has outperformed other approaches by huge margins leading to economic booms for small startups and, and big companies as well. And the success has been made um, possible partly uh, due to the availability of large data sets and of course advances in hardware. Um, so machine learning and medical imaging also has the potential to make huge advances in medicine and in healthcare, assisting in a whole bunch of different areas which um, will be helpful for, for everyone. So of course things like patient diagnosis, so um, from images, um, understanding disease development, so here you can see a normal brain um, and a patient with Alzheimer's and you can see the differences. Um, predicting patient outcome from images. So here you have, for example, liver images of patients with cancers and determining things like survival time or, or estimates um, about what will happen to the patient. Um, speeding up and making accurate clinical trials for new treatments. So here you can see, for example, um, there's a tumor and it's shrinking over time. So potentially this person is responding to a particular treatment. Um, and permitting advances in personalized medicine. So this is really, really exciting. Um, and so, for example, uh, predicting what will happen to the patient, what will the image look like in some future time point um, will help us give patients the corresponding treatment uh, according to our prediction. So these are all very exciting, and there have been a lot of different research areas looking at machine learning, uh, a lot of successful techniques in medical image analysis for segmentation, for registration, for prediction. But most of the approaches have not yet been widely integrated into real clinical practice, as many of you know. So why is that? Um, 
So, uh, of course, machine learning algorithms are developed mostly in computer science labs or electrical engineering labs, and oftentimes those labs don't have access to large-scale data, certainly not annotated data that they need, for example, for training. Um, and oftentimes the development is in isolation. There isn't necessarily contact with a clinician, and really, while they're developing their algorithms, they don't really have maybe contact with what are the real clinical needs for this particular problem. So as a result, there are a lot of frameworks based on small proprietary data sets or these um, challenge or benchmarking data sets. Um, so as a result, sometimes you, you get these algorithms that maybe are not going to be as robust to variability across scanners, across patient population, and certainly um, across uh, disease tied to a specific clinical task of interest. So um, in my group, I'm really focusing on sort of bridging the gap between computer vision, machine learning, medical image analysis, but I'm really focusing on real clinical applications and trying to, to focus on the impact in, in areas, for example, of neurology and neurosurgery. And the only way this is possible, in my view, is through interdisciplinary collaboration. So uh, working with neurologists, neurosurgeons, working with machine learning experts, and really working with both clinical uh, people and industrial partners in medical image industry. So I'll talk to you a little bit today about um, sort of a big data, big data set for in terms of medical imaging, big data, um, and, and this area that I've been working on for quite some time. Um, so I have a long-term collaboration with a company called NeuroRx. NeuroRx provides software analysis to all the big pharmaceutical industry for almost all the new clinical trial, um, the clinical trials for multiple sclerosis worldwide. So they've given me access to a lot of MS clinical trial data, um, over 10,000 patient images from different active trials, from different imaging centers, different scanners, and I have um, different sequence MRIs. Um, so here you can see, for example, this is the same patient uh, with different types of MRIs, different parameters, T1, T2, PD, flare. These are all the same patient with different types of MRI sequences. Um, I have images over different time points, but much more importantly, I have um, at NeuroRx, there are 40 or 50 neuroradiologists that sit there all day long manually annotating data very carefully in order to, uh, you know, use them in the context of clinical trials, so determining whether a particular treatment is working or not. So I have access to all the, those sort of ground truth labels as well. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit why that's flickering later. Um, so the idea is here that um, the point is the in interdisciplinary collaboration with the company, with neurologists and researchers at the Montreal Neurological Institute, and machine learning researchers, which led to all these machine learning methods, which I'll talk about, which are, are basically trying to improve the analysis of real patient images from clinical trial data sets. So the clinical outcome, I'll, I'll tell you the punchline up front, the algorithms that I'm going to be describing have been placed in the commercial software pipeline line of my industrial partner, where the improved efficiency and precision is about 5x fold. So that works well for the company, saving time, saving money, but also in terms of improved treatment analysis. So getting um, analysis done quickly and getting the treatments out to patients, therefore, quicker. So almost all, let's say 22 out of the 23 new MS drugs that are in circulation worldwide have been used, um, have, been, have been placed out there by using um, some of the software that I'll describe. So in terms of the overview of the talk, I'll talk to you a little bit about machine learning techniques. I'm going to focus on probabilistic graphical models for detection and segmentation of lesions and brain tumors. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some work that we were doing now and recently on probabilistic prediction of future MS disease activity and treatment <coughs> responders. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm working on and some thoughts on in general and conclusions. So what is multiple sclerosis? Multiple sclerosis is the most common neurological disease affecting young people. So people in their 30s, pre predominantly women, uh, predominantly Canadian, so we have the highest percentage in the world. Um, and it's a disease where the patient's own immune system attacks the myelin sheath, the covering in the nerve cells in the brain causing disability. And the most common form is this relapsing remitting, where you get these intermittent attacks or relapses over time, uh, followed by full or partial recovery. So for example, you may lose the ability to use your left arm and then feel better and then suddenly become blind in your right eye. And it, it just comes and goes in that sense. There is no cure. There are 
treatments available which help mitigate symptoms, which slow down the course of the disease, um, but we need a lot more clinical trials uh, to figure out new treatments. So here we have an image um, on the left of a patient with multiple sclerosis, and you can see in red are these annotated areas where um, there are lesions in the brain. So one of the hallmarks of MS are these appearance of these bright lesions in the T2 sequence of the MRI. And T T2 lesion volume is really one way to estimate how the patient's doing in terms of burden of disease. So how active is this patient? Um, what stage are they in? How are they doing? And the current clinical pro protocol is really manual or semi-manual segmentation of these lesions. Of course, that's very expensive. You need a trained neuroradiologist. Um, it's very slow. And much more importantly, it's inconsistent, both for the same manual rater on a different day and between raters. So this is, in fact, problematic. So obviously, we need automatic approaches to accurately segment these T2 lesions. So I'm going to stand back for a second, talk about segmentation, and then talk about what we mean um, by segmentation. So, of course, in computer vision, here's some examples of segmentation tasks. Usually we're talking about labeling each pixel as being a member of a class or, let's say, the background. And the results of the automatic technique are really about making sure that your pixels are as close as possible to manual segmentation. If you look at these images, mostly the objects are in some pronounced region of interest, and they have some sort of color, intensity, texture pattern, or somewhat, that is distinctive from the background. So in medical imaging, um, there are a lot of techniques that have been worked on to segment healthy structures in the brain or in other body parts, and they've been very successful. And in some ways, they're very similar to the problem that I just talked about. So they're really designed to segment a structure, a large structure. So for example, here's the bone in CT. In, in, in X-ray, here's a hippocampus in the brain. Here's um, prostate in the ultrasound. So we're really trying, there's a region of interest. We know the objects in there. Um, and we're trying to delineate the boundary. So it's very similar to what I refer to in computer vision. Um, we can make use of prior knowledge where that object must be, the shape information. For example, um, this is the liver lobe. Uh, size, textures, we can make use of that. Things become a little bit um, more difficult when you have pathology or some sort of disease structure within the brain. So it's focal pathology I'm talking about. So first is the detection task. I have to find the pathology. Then we need to segment it. So there's really a two-part problem that we need to think about. Here's a lung lesion from CT, and here are stroke lesions from MRI um, that you can see here. So the challenges are, of course, that there's a lot more variability in terms of intensity, shape, location. Ground truth is sort of in quotations, whereas in the previous image I can figure out what the boundaries are for the cat. Um, the boundaries of the pathology in the image is often not well, um, is not a well-posed problem. So, and again, if you have basically, look, if you look at this stroke image, I don't know if you could see my mouse. You can look at the stroke image over here. There is a big, big blob here, and you can sort of see that it's not so hard to figure out that, oops, that there is a blob. What just happened? Yeah, OK. Um, so you can see that there is a blob. It's not so hard. And you can explicitly uh, em employ some sort of prior information to say, hey, there's something irregular there. I've seen enough healthy brains to know that that, that particular area is not OK. So the problem that I'm going to be referring to today is the problem of multiple sclerosis lesions. And so if you look, here are a bunch of brain images, and in red are the lesions. Um, so you can see here that lesions appear quite differently from brain to brain. Uh, they, you cannot, uh, they have different shapes. They have different appearances. They can be very tiny, and most are very tiny, from three to five voxels in size. And they can go up to over 100 uh, lesion loads. So a patient can have one lesion. They can have over 100 lesions. It's really, um, it's really not clear. And really, lesions make up a very small percentage of the brain. So um, you have to hunt for it. And the most important thing is that lesions have intensities and textures that overlap those of healthy structures. So this is actually very problematic. You can actually look at a tiny white blob, and it looks like a lesion to maybe my eye, but it is, in fact, not. Um, so consequently, we cannot use shape priors. We can't use size models. Um, we can't use regions of interest. And local intensities are not going to be enough. So there have been a lot of techniques that have been developed to accurately segment T2 lesion voxels. And this is very helpful if you want to th think about things like lesion volume. So they actually work pretty well. The problem is, is that they're optimized to have high segmentation accuracy. So they work really well for, for example, finding the large lesions. So for example, 
we use things like dice. So if you look at dice overlap metric, you can have sort of find the two big lesions and miss the three small ones and really have the same dice as if you found them. It's really, the, the metric is not meant for, for small lesions. So if you use a lot of these me methods, you end up missing a lot of the small lesions. So that might not be important for, let's say, diagnosis, but for clinical trials, this is actually really a problem. So for, for clinical trials, beyond, we need beyond just finding um, and, and the lesion volume. We have a lot of metrics that we need to think about to determine what we call burden of disease and activity to measure treatment efficacy. So to determine whether a drug is working. So we need to do things like we need the number and lesion volume of the T2 lesions. We need the number of new T2 lesions over time. And we need the number of gadolinium enhanced lesions, which I'll explain shortly. So basically what I'm saying is, is that we need to count. We need to count all the lesions, including the tiny ones, um, and most of them are small. And so this is really a lesion level detection task more than a segmentation task. Um, and the thing is that's also important is that consistency over time is very important. So um, my algorithm, if I say there's five lesions at time point one, five lesions in time point two, and then there's seven, that means potentially that the drug's not working, the patient's getting more and more lesions. But if I had an al algorithm, um, another, if the manual segmentation was saying that there were six, six, and then eight, it doesn't really matter. What we're trying to see is consistency over time points. Um, any machine learning technique that we develop for this context has to be robust to different clinical trials. I can't train it on one trial, uh, and every time I get a new trial, I need to retrain. So we need to be robust. We need to be robust to different scanners, whether it's GE or Philips, different centers, and different disease stage. So to this end, we developed a probabilistic machine learning framework. Actually, it's an iterative hierarchical graphical model. It's, in fact, a Markov random field to detect and segment T2 lesions um, in, in MRI. So I think, I think I'm going to use the pointer. Uh, or maybe not. OK. So um, here we can see, oh, here it's my mouse. So basically, we get multi-sequence MRI that come in. And I have a voxel level MRF, which I'll describe in a moment, which is basic job is to look throughout the brains and find lesion voxels that I think uh, are good candidates. And here I'm really interested in lesion voxels um, that anything that looks lesion-like um, I should pick up at this point. Then I go to, um, I group together lesion candidates. And here so you can see sort of the red are real, uh, are false the red are real lesions and the green are false positives. And I go to a higher level regional based MRF, which tries to basically distinguish between real lesions and false positives. And I'll describe that in a second. And the system sort of iterates between these two. So if you look at the um, adapted sort of voxel level MRF, I'll just tell you a little bit about Markov random fields in this context. So again, if you're not that familiar with it, Markov random fields assign a random variable, in this case, at every voxel. And this is a 3D MRF, so it looks at voxels in plane and out of plane. And it, at every node, we have intensity information. So whereas in computer vision, we have RGB, here we have multimodal MRI, so we have a multitude of intensities. So the classic MRF, uh, which is, is used a lot, makes a POTS, is a POTS model, will basically smooth out these lesions, OK? A classic MRF is meant to have a smooth segmentation, but it's not meant to find tiny, uh, par tiny lesions. It's really meant to clean out noise that, that occur in tiny islands in your image. So we have a variant of, the, um, of an MRF, which basically takes into account at every voxel, all the surrounding intensities in the neighborhood. So we have the uh, a unary prior term, which is pretty typical, which looks at um, the probability of the class um, given the intensity, but also given the intensity of the neighbors. We now we also have a unary prior term, probability of C, um, which looks at sort of the prior at that node. We have the likelihood, and we have the neighboring prior, which is the last term. But we also have an additional term, which um, 
which is basically looking at the intensity difference likelihood. So we're actually modeling contrast between classes. What are a common contrast between classes? And so it's that third term here at the bottom, the log of the probability of the delta i. So basically within all these little cliques, I want to learn what are normal differences within a lesion so that I don't run them over in, in my optimization. So then I go to uh, get lesion candidates and I go to the higher regional level MRF. And here's a regional MRF. So we have a node now at every possible structure in the brain, including lesion candidates. And we have a optimization function which looks at the node and looks at the texture of the node, the likelihood of the node, but also looks at the relationship to neighboring nodes through these arcs. This is a non-lattice based MRF, so it's not a regular grid. And it's basically looking at context. Does it make sense that this is a lesion given the surrounding structures? And we have these arcs, which were basically telling us how attracted or repelled we should be from our neighbors. Um, and so this basically helps us remove implausible lesions, things that look like lesions completely. Their textures could look like lesions, but they're surrounded by structures in some way that is not use usual for lesions. So the method is actually very, it, it iterates back and forth between um, the regional and the uh, voxel-based MRF until convergence. And it's actually very robust, and it works al across different multicenter clinical trial data sets. So we trained, in this case, we had a, a data set of 1,320 patients with uh, 1.5 Tesla MRI and another one, a smaller one with 3T. And we had two different uh, clinical trials that we tested our, our algorithm on. Um, and one of them, uh, you can see that even one clinical trial has something like data from 128 different centers. So we, here we can plot, it's the plot of sensitivity versus false detection rate, and our, our algorithm is the top one in the red. And but for most of the algorithms, it works pretty similarly to other methods, except for the small lesions. So this is just showing lesions um, that are 3 to 10 voxels in size. And you can see that there, our approach had significant advantage for these small lesions. 40% um, of our data sets are small lesions. Okay, So um, this was actually incredibly important because it was able to find it. So the method is generalizable to other, other different problems. We worked a lot on brain tumor segmentation. And so here you can see on the left are two different patients. Um, on the left, you can see, you can sort of see with your own naked eye uh, where the tumor is. Um, and so the idea is to detect the tumor and then segment it into its constituent parts. So um, in green, you can see that's the edema, meaning the swelling around the tumor. And the red are the necrotic core, where the cancer has sort of eaten away at the tissue. Um, we have enhancing tissue, which is uh, tumors, which is where there's new tumorous activity and solid tumor. So the goal is to try to find all these sub sub-tissues. So I, I basically applied the exact same technique, but instead of um, just looking at lesions and healthy tissues, um, I'm now looking at four different kinds of unhealthy tissues. So the idea is to first, we use uh, sort of texturing models to actually get the probability of where we think the lesion, the, the big tumor is within the brain. And then we go back and forth from the voxel level to the regional level uh, and iterate until convergence. So you can see at the bottom is the final classification, and it's very similar to the expert model. Here's some results with high-grade glioma on the top and low-grade glioma at the bottom. So it's uh, T1 and T2 images. And then the third column is basically is, is the output of the algorithm and the last column are the experts. So it was one of the top performing methods in the 2012 and 2013 Bratz, Mikhail Bratz challenges. Um, so it performed really well. We did not enter it into any more challenges because in later challenges, this uh, particular result, as well as some other two other algorithms, were merged together to create ground truth um, for subsequent challenges. So we were no longer permitted to to uh, or we didn't we chose not to participate in the challenges anymore. Um, so this algorithm is actually uh, licensed to a company in Toronto called Synaptive Medical. Synaptive Medical is a company that builds these neurosurgical imaging platforms used by hospitals in, throughout North America for surgical planning. We're still working with Synaptive to get better and better tumor segmentation and healthy uh, tissue segmentation. They're using it, they were going to use it within their platform to help surgeons plan where they're going to resect the tumor. 
Okay, so the next sort of thing that we're focused on, because I mentioned it earlier, is really the detection of new pathology over time. So there are many different problems within medical imaging where we're interested in knowing, uh, is this pathological structure growing or shrinking and what's happening to it over time? So in the context of multiple sclerosis, lesions often grow and then partly or completely resolve. So here's an example just to show you what this flashing is. These are patients over time. And I don't know if you can see, but some of them you can see a lesion appear and disappear. So they, they basically come and go. And the appearance of these new T2 lesions are used as a surrogate for disease activity. And what that means is, um, as lesions appear, it sort of uh, tells you something about new activity of the disease. So new T2 lesion counts and volume are used as an endpoint in clinical trials. That means that they help us determine whether a drug is working. We really count to see how many new T2 lesions this person has when they're on the drug, and that tells us if the drug is working. So again, it's manual, semi-manual segmentation um, is used, and it's very inconsistent over time. The same person can look at one time point and a different time point and, get, um, and, and be very inconsistent. So the whole point of, of what we need is we need to increase uh, segmentation consistency over time to get a precise measurement of, what, of the lesion actual change. So why not just subtract two images? So here's baseline and a follow-up scan of the same patient. And here's the difference image on the right. So you can see this is what we call a subtraction image. And it's used a lot to determine changes over the baseline and the next time point. But you can see here, for example, that there is new lesion activity. And there's lesions that are shrinking. But you can see that there's a lot more going on in that subtraction image. And so there are a lot of different reasons why you might have um, why you might have sort of bright spots or dark spots in the subtraction imaging. So for example, local misregistration, brain atrophy, like your brain is shrinking, artifacts, they all lead to differences in the image. So in fact, simple subtraction imaging is not enough. We really want to figure out intensity differences due to the disease or the lesion activity over artifactual changes. So we built this, um, the first automatic Bayesian sort of 4D segmentation of, of temporal evolution of lesions. Um, it looks at lesion, it looks at images over time, and it considers all of them over time at once. So on the left, you can see a baseline image, and then week 4, 12, 20, and so on. So it's the same patient over time. It's a fully probabilistic Bayesian method that learns sort of models of changes of intensity, changes in class evolution over time. And to permit it to, to work in a clinical trial, our method actually differentiates between new lesions, which you can see in green, um, resolving lesions, which you can see um, in blue, which is basically lesions that shrink, and stable lesions in red. Because you really need to figure out um, what is actually going on in terms of really we're focused on the new lesions. So I don't have time to, to go through the math of that, but uh, if anyone's interested in talking to me about how we did this, um, the math is actually quite long, and I don't have time to get through it. So the third thing I just wanted to talk about, because I said we need to count. We need to count T2, new T2, and we need to also look at gadolinium. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about enhanced pathology now. So there are many different problems in medical imaging where we're interested in, in enhanced pathology. So that means we inject the patient with a contrast agent, and we want to see where there's new disease activity. It could be cancer, and it could be, in this case, MS. So on the left, um, there are some breast images. So um, enhancement actually shows up as new bright spots in the image. Um, and there are other cancerous examples here. So in the context of MS, we inject the patient with a contrast agent, and the portion of the lesions that in T1 that enhance after T1 injection are associated with what we call new active inflammation. So this is really important. It actually is telling us that there's new activity within the brain, and we need, and therefore it tells us something again about the treatment. So it's an important marker for treatment effect. It's an invasive modality, um, and uh, it's not always performed, but in this clinical trial, uh, they performed it in order to see um, how the patients are doing. So the first time point, you can see T1 before contrast. The middle, you could see after contrast. And then you can see the manual labels of all the little, what we call GAD lesions within the brain. And so you can see they're, they're, um, they're small, and they're throughout the brain. And again, for the purposes of clinical trials, we need to count them. So the issue is here, you can see on the top left, before contrast and after contrast. So on the bottom left, um, you see an enhancement map. 
So if you take the two images and then you just look at what are the t top 20% enhancement between these two images. Let's just look at all the things that enhance in the top 20%. You get this kind of enhancement map at the bottom. So you can see here, among all the things that enhance, in fact, in, uh, over here you can see there are only a few of them that are in fact that alinium enhances lesion. Okay, so if you actually look at these in green are actually lesions due to the disease, but there are a lot of other things that enhance. So this is really sort of a needle in the haystack kind of problem among all these things. Find those tiny GAD lesions that are really what we're interested in. So here's a problem where we have a lot of, um, we, we, have, we can't uh, actually get a region of interest, we can't figure out shape, location, or intensity, and again, lesions are often very tiny here. And so what do we mean by that? Um, so here are two examples of two different brains, two different patients. So on the top, we see the top of the brain, the cortex, then the enhancement image, and then the third image shows you among all those things that enhance, it's only that tiny little square that we're trying to find. In column D is actually um, zoomed in on that little area, and in column E is in fact the ground truth. So I have to find that little tiny lesion um, in, in both of these different images. So I can't use segmentation techniques that work with large pathologies, obviously. I just talked about MRFs. MRFs are useful, but again, classic MRFs won't work here at all. But MRFs are actually very helpful. They're generative models. So when you can actually generate probability density functions of everything you're interested in, they're great. Um, in this particular case, um, we need, we're just trying to differentiate between lesion and non-lesion, and they're very complex models that we'll have to build. So instead of MRFs, we're going to look at CRFs. So at the top, you can see MRFs actually build density functions for each class, whereas CRFs are discriminative models. They're, they don't really try to attempt to build the underlying distributions. They focus on the decision boundary, and they try to sort of estimate the posterior of the class given the observations directly. So they're really helpful for when you want to figure out long range interactions between labels and observations. So we built a conditional random field, the first one uh, for automatic detection of gadolinium enhanced MS in brain MRI. Um, so I, I'll just tell you uh, a little bit about how this method works. So the idea is, again, you take all the different MRI and you have a voxel level MRF as the first thing you do. And so just to tell you the difference between what we showed before, a, a voxel level MRF basically just looks at all the posterior. So you have here a unary, pairwise, and triple posterior that I'm interested in, and of course the relationship between the classes. So Y are the classes and X are the observations. And we basically learn these with discriminators for each one of these functions. And we learn these lambdas, which are weights, um, and are telling us how much, which we learn from training data, how much each of these terms are important for our energy functional. And so once we have a bunch of lesion candidates, um, we can then, you know, in terms of voxels, we again group them. So here's uh, in green are true positives, and on red are false positives. And then we go to a higher order uh, textural feature model um, for candidate lesions. It's a, an adaptive level CRF, which looks at um, the group and looks at textures and wants to basically remove all these false positives and refine the boundaries of the true positives. So the idea is to look at a bounding box around each of these candidates and then look at um, trying to estimate that node Y, the class for the entire patch, um, using different texture models. So just to show you kind of briefly, in green are the lesional enhancements at the bottom, and on the top are, in fact, the, the non-lesional enhancements over here. So these are just two different examples. If you learn, if you look at a bunch of different texture patterns, you can see that they're different, and we can get our CRF to try to pull apart uh, each of these features. You don't have to worry about what they mean. They're basically histograms um, of texture features. So once we have that, our higher level uh, CRF is really taking both voxel information and taking textural information into account. So we, we look at the voxels, and we also then look at the, the whole group, Y, this is the big Y, with, um, given H, which is the textures. And then we try to see if we can get some sort of agreement between the voxels and the, the whole patch, given the particular texture model. So, in, in medical images, oftentimes to help us, we often have the same patient image, let's say, six months earlier. So on the top, you can see the image that we're interested in, and green squares, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, indicate lesions. 
Um, and red squares are false positives. But if you look six months earlier at those regions, you see that some of these lesions weren't even there six months earlier. Um, and so one of the things that we then modified is something called the VAT, which is a temporal hierarchical uh, MRF. And there we looked at both um, the current time point and the, the previous time point, and we enter them into our graphical model. So here, for example, these are non-lesions and these are lesions, and you can see that they have very different temporal models. Lesions actually are, change a lot more than other vessel or other enhancements um, within the brain. So here we have, again, big clinical data, not what we mean in computer vision, but definitely for medical imaging. We trained on a, a large multi-center uh, multi clinical trial here. We had thousands of scans from 247 different centers, and we tested it on two different clinical trials, also very big from our point of view. Um, we had a lot of different sizes of lesions, different numbers of lesions. I think it's very important to say that a big percentage of these brains had no lesions, no GAD lesions. So again, we want to make sure that we don't say that we have one false positive. One false positive means that the drug didn't work. Um, so we have to be very careful at that bridge between zero lesions and even just one. So the ground truth here, which makes some people um, jealous, is really that we had manual labeling from two trained expert neuroradiologists that sat down and, and, and actually labeled them and then came to a consensus. And when they couldn't agree, they had a third expert radiologist check uh, the data sets to come to an agreement. So that's as close as a ground truth as we get to in medical imaging. Um, here are three different results, the qualitative results. On the top, um, you can see the image, the enhancement, and the lesion. So I have a zoom in on those tiny lesions that this algorithm found in each of those cases. And I'll just show you the difference between the two algorithms. When in blue is when um, the original CRF, and the top one is when we actually made use of uh, temporal information, so information from the previous time point. So these are actually really exciting results. Um, Again, sensitivities that go up to 0.95 are huge. What we don't want are false negatives in a lot of these detection tasks. Um, as I spoke to someone else who's working on breast cancer earlier today, uh, it's the most important thing not to have false negatives because uh, at the expense of maybe having a few false positives because then uh, experts can go back and check the results and get rid of a false positive, but they really cannot uh, find the false negative. So again, though, I should state at the bottom the false detection rate is the number of false detections per uh, per patient. So this is 0.1 false positives per patient. Um, and we applied the same algorithm to uh, heart. Um, so this is myocardium enhanced pathology. Again, enhanced pathology, you inject the patient with um, a particular enhancing agent and you want to see whether there's pathology. So in, that, in this case, this is from a challenge at Mikai um, and we applied it to this algorithm, um, the, the vi variant of this algorithm and on top you can see ground truth up on the top right. And this is the result of the algorithm. This is sort of other variants of the algorithm. So we did really well. We won Best Paper Award. And um, I think that uh, the algorithm is quite general. So again, just to emphasize, uh, all of these worked well enough to be in, in the actual software pipeline to analyze clinical trials. Um, the important thing is the faster treatment assessment to remove the time-consuming neuroradiologist job. And we can never just fully remove, but instead of having, for example, two neuroradiologists, you can have a radi neuroradiologist and computer coming to a consensus and, and, and so on. So again, almost all the new MS drugs developed um, have, have actually been processed through these algorithms. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what we're working on now. Um, last year's Mikai, we had a paper on predicting future disease activity and responders to treatment. So here we're really interested in knowing from a baseline scan, what kind of future disease activity will this patient have? So will they have new lesions? Will their lesions grow? And really we just want to use the initial baseline scan. So why is this important? Because then we could have a good model of understanding natural patient worsening. Like So people tend to look like this two years later. And predicting treatment effects. So for example, these patients on the treatment is actually doing really well. We can have models saying these are the kinds of people that respond well to treatments, and we can look at identifying potential treatment responders, which is really important because some of these trials that I'm showing you are failed trials, but that means that it didn't work for most people, but it definitely worked for some people. So the idea is to find who those people are and to offer those similar kinds of people to offer them treatment um, that would work. 
So here's a baseline scan. This is what I mean by inactive. You have a patient, which is not coming out very nicely in this color. But after two years, basically the brain hasn't changed. So we call that an inactive patient. On the right, you have what we call an active patient. There's a lot of new lesions and huge lesion growth. We say this patient is active. So the idea is we built this probabilistic machine learning techniques to predict new lesion activity in relapsing remitting patients based only on the images. Um, we had a, f a representation which basically encodes common, it actually learned what are common lesion types across a population, and then represented a brain as sort of a collection of lesion types, which actually we called a, a bag of lesions, and I'll show you what that is. So this is the type of thing the algorithm came up with. It's a, a probabilistic sort of EM style classical like clustering algorithm. So these three rows actually show different um, lesion types. So on the top, for example, you may have a small lesion in a particular area of the white matter, and that doesn't matter where in the deep white matter it is. It actually says across the population, I found this lesion type on top, which is similar across people. Here we have small lesions in the top of the brain in the cortex across the population, and here we have sort of big lesions around the ventricles. So it actually automatically found those lesion types, and then um, kind of merged brains as, as sort of looking at them as a bag of lesions. So these are brains, for example, that are all the same in the sense that they have a few big lesions around the ventricles, say, and a few tiny ones in the white matter. I don't care where exactly in the deep white matter, and it doesn't matter if there's five or six. It's just showing that they're similar types. And we use these to predict the probability of new activity. And the point of why we did this is we really wanted to see, with this prediction, can we actually look at predicting possible responders to treatment? And that's going to be important if we want to th start thinking about personalized medicine. So here's a clinical trial of 1,000 patients that we had. This is the only trial we had what we call treatment codes, meaning we knew exactly who was on a placebo, who was on treatment A, who was on treatment B. But we had no ground truth as to what a responder was to a drug, so we made up our own definition. So here we have built three activity prediction models, one for the, the placebo and one for each treatment. And so for in a training image of somebody on the treatment here on the top, you can see that basically we defined him to be a responder if under the placebo model this person had a high probability of being active two years later, but in fact was not active, had no new lesion later, so we call this person a responder. And then we did 50-fold cross-validation for a test case to see if we can determine a responder automatically. So we ran it through the placebo model if it had a high probability of, of being active two years later, but a very high probability of being inactive two years later, we decided that person was a responder to treatment. And in fact, we got very promising preliminary results, which had very high sensitivities in both drugs. So the importance of this is the possibility for personalized medicine, um, and we are working on some deep learning methods now with much bigger data sets now that we have bigger data sets to, to develop it further. So that brings me to uh, what we're working on today. So I talked to you about relapsing remitting. So if you look at disability over time, relapsing remitting, you're sort of disabled, but then you get better. And you're disabled and you get better. But after a while, you become, you, you lead to sort of secondary progressive disease, which basically you continue to get worse over time. And so this is where everybody ends up. So this is secondary progressive, a small member of the population actually are progressive from the beginning, so that we call them primary progressive. And there's no drugs that really worked until this last past year on, on these patients at all. This is not a very well understood part of the disease, and we really need to figure out some outcome predictors for clinical trials for progressive MS. So we, I'm part of a really big uh, and exciting new grant. It's an international multidisciplinary collaborative research grant. To, and the first job of the grant is to put together the first big progressive MS data set. We're talking about around 40,000 patients over time. We already have uh, around 10,000 from hospitals around the world and all of the large uh, phase three clinical trials in, in progressive MS, including the one that I just mentioned earlier from Roche in France. Um, so unlike, unlike relapsing remitting, we really don't know um, 
how to predict how well these pay people will be uh, doing. So progression is not well correlated with lesions or any known anatomical structure. So this is a perfect place to actually try out deep learning techniques. We really don't know what we're looking for. We would like to automatically discover MRI biomarkers that will predict disability in patients with this disease and an outcome measure for early phase clinical trials to, to figure out clinical, uh, to figure out dr uh, drug discovery. So again, this is an unsupervised discovery. Um, it may not actually be that, we may not find anything in the images. We're hoping that we will. And we do have clinical progression in some of them, uh, outcome measures. So we are actually looking at target clinical prediction as output. And we also have temporal information, so people over time. So we're going to learn something about the temporal evolution of this disease. And hopefully, in this case, machine learning techniques will be able to assist clinic clinicians in understanding this phase of the disease a little bit better. So that brings me to my sort of conclusion uh, sort of slides, the question, the elephant in the room. Um, so why can't we use deep learning techniques to solve all medical imaging problems? They work, obviously, really well in computer vision. Um, so again, uh, this is sort of big picture in computer vision. We all know that deep learning is in the room. Uh, in medical imaging, it's been a lot slower to adopt deep learning techniques. The last two years have been, um, there's a lot of growth and interest in deep learning techniques in the context of medical imaging. Why is it slower than computer vision? For all the reasons that I already talked about earlier, we don't have small data sets, we don't have annotations, but I think it's important to say that there was resistance from a lot of clinicians and researchers to sort of black box solutions. Um, and so I, I, I think that there are many, many um, machine learning researchers which are interested in going into this domain. And there are many tasks where this dom these kinds of techniques work really well, especially if the data is available. Um, so I think, for example, the prediction uh, tasks, they're perfectly well suited, and I have a lot of data, and so that's helpful. Um, there have been a number of frameworks developed for other problems in medical imaging with sort of very mixed results. So in the BRADS challenge last year, there were a lot of deep learning techniques out there, uh, and they were very successful. But the survival prediction uh, challenge, where they asked you to predict the survival of people with brain tumors with about 200, uh, less than 200 cases, did not work well at all. So in the task of lesion segmentation, there are a number of deep learning techniques that I have been proposed. They work well on large lesions, and we've also tried a whole bunch of different techniques, and they don't work as well as the graphical models that I presented on small lesions. A lot of false positives and mixed uh, missed lesions. So again, um, take home message that um, off-the-shelf deep learning techniques don't always work well for some medical imaging tasks. Uh, that being said, um, that's actually a good thing because we can actually develop new techniques for these domains, and I think um, uh, I think that there's a lot of excitement and promise for that. Take-home message two, which is my final message, is that everything that we do develop, though, we better make sure that both the techniques and the measures are tied to a particular um, end goal, a clinical task. So, for example, automatic lesion analysis here really is focused on the drug development problem. Tumor segmentation should be helpful in, in, in assisting in neurosurgical planning. Um, prediction of potential responders. Uh, really focused on personalized medicine, and really use these techniques to help us understanding diseases and facilitate discovery. But all this to say, I do think that we're at a very big uh, sort of turning point in the field of medical imaging, and it will, in fact, revolutionize a lot of approaches in, in medicine. So I just want to thank the students who did all the work, um, and my collaborators, and uh, of course, uh, the companies that I work closely with, as well as the granting agencies, and thank you for your attention. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, we do have time for, uh, for questions. I guess I'll start off. I was uh, interested when you mentioned that uh, some of the researchers were hesitant about deep learning because they wanted to be able to peer into the They didn't like the black box, which implies they wanted to peer into the box. Right. Do, do uh, so the medical people suggest you know, terms in your functional? Do they understand what they mean? How do they mean? Do you look at the questions when they're recorded? So, um, <laughs> so the question was, uh, if I understand correctly, that clinicians weren't so happy with the black box approach, and you were asking me, um, I guess, if they were involved in the development that I, I had put together. 
they want to know why. So you've predicted um, that this person will survive a certain number of years. What is it in the anatomy in the brain that told you that? So a lot of these techniques now um, that are going back and trying to expose features in a way that is helpful anatomically um, are being bought into much more. They want to know why. So a lot of these sort of classic features, they sort, you, they sort of understand why, and they're based on sort of understanding of what the images are showing uh, in terms of, say, classic textures and so on. Yes? Yes. Which of them are clinically used? You said the big motivation for your presentation today is that you want to do clinically useful work. Right. So among them, which of them are clinically used? So that was a good question. So the question is, among all the things that I presented, which is clinically used, um, and so the answer is that the uh, gadolinium enhanced lesion segmentation is used directly in the software platform to determine whether a drug is, uh, has a new number of counts. So for clinical trial development, the number, the new T2, the Bayesian uh, new T2 method is also used within um, that clinical uh, protocol. I'm hoping that the segmentation that I'm using is, use, is going to be used with Synaptive uh, in all the neurosurgical platforms that are out there. Um, so, so those are the ones that I, I think the the the, the progressive MS, I'm working directly with the companies that are working directly with pharmaceutical industry. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be helpful in, in progressive MS. Pardon me? Uh, pathology AI, yeah. Yes, so um, we, we don't hope to uh, replace radiologists, and we hope to work with them and understand the disease better. Um, thank, you. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, how generalizable are your techniques to uh, different field strands? Most of your training data is at 1.5G. I mean, you're applying different techniques to different field strands. Right. So that's a great question. How generalizable is it to different um, different magnets? I guess. Um, so we have uh, one. We have 1.5. We have 3T. So for the MRF type approaches, for sure, we're going to have to we train separately on each of those strengths. We have different scanners uh, within them, but and different centers. But we have to train separately. For the deep learning, we're hoping that we don't need to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you for your attention.